Okay, so we're going to start with the land acknowledgement first. This is the Ryerson land acknowledgement. So Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Eshinabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited to this treaty in, this, in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So my name is Sarah Joda. I identify as she, her, and I'm an undergraduate research assistant. Um, and the project that we are working on today is for the Rights for Children and Youth Partnership Project. Um, which was developed to increase knowledge and evidence around the factors that support or hinder the protection of children and youth rights in Central America and the Caribbean and their diaspora populations in Canada. So what we want to know is everyone's experiences in the Canadian educational system and how their ethnicities impact their experiences. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Sanchez Morales. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, I'm a current undergrad research assistant at the RCIP project. And today this webinar, the purpose of this webinar is to listen and explore different experiences of Central American youth within the Canadian educational system. We want to uh, learn a little bit more about their limitations, challenges, positive or negative feedback that they have and the encounters that they have within the Canadian educational system. In order to do so, we're going to welcome our participants uh, who decided to voluntarily participate in this webinar. So let's start with Stephanie. Hi, my name is Stephanie Ashley Arias Argeta. I identify as she and her, the pronouns. My background, well, my parents, uh, they were born in El Salvador. I was born here in Canada, as well as my older, my two older sisters, we were born here as well. Um, and uh, well, I'm just, I consider myself like a participant or volunteer for this uh, project or research uh, being done. Thank you. Um, the next one, uh, Xavier. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Xavier Neta Aguirre. I am 24 years old. My pronouns go as he and his. Um, I was born here in Canada. Um, however, my parents are both from El Salvador as well as my two older siblings. Um, I recently just finished an undergrad degree in anthropology at York University. So I'm just here to talk about uh, my experiences in the education system in Canada, and specifically in post-secondary. Amazing, thank you, Xavier. Uh, Xavier, sorry. And last one, uh, Lilia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lilia. Uh, I identify myself as a she, her. Uh, I'm from Nicaragua, and well, I'm here also, like Stephanie and Xavier, uh, to share uh, a little bit of my experiences here in, in the Canadian education system. So thank you so much for having me. Great. So let's get it started. Um, for today, our first question for all of the participants is, do you think your Central American identity has impacted your experience in the educational system? So if you want to start, Stephanie, you can go ahead. Um, no, I do not think my Central American identity has impacted my experience in the education system because uh, I was born in Canada to Salvadorian refugees. However, I still identify as Salvadorian. And if anything, uh, one of the obstacles would have been uh, language barriers because, um, for example, in my case, uh, my father on, on my father's side uh, they all speak uh, Spanish and the majority of, of the family from my father's side is still living in El Salvador currently to this day and I the last time I have seen them when I is whenever I go visit as a Canadian uh, to El Salvador and uh, also um, my mother like she came when she was uh, 17 and as her youngest daughter now I'm currently 25 years old so it was uh, difficult uh, for her to adapt, especially uh, when it comes to the to uh, first finding a part-time job and then uh, also balancing uh, the education life, like uh, attending, uh, uh, for example, uh, university or, or, or college. Um, so uh, also because, you know, they, they were uh, newcomers, they were immigrants, 
Um, they were unable to um, help me with my school homework. Um, as I, you know, started uh, junior kindergarten all through ways through uh, high school. And, and then uh, we kind of have stuck with an accent as well, right? Because, because I, well now, uh, before I was just Canadian, but then, you know, I went to the Council of Salvador in Toronto and became officially a Salvadorian myself, like just another statistic, you know, to the population back home in El Salvador. And uh, so, um, and also, you know, to this day, my, my parents are still learning about the educational system. So I would answer the first question uh, like that. <laughs> Sounds great. Like, honestly, it sounds like a lot of challenges that you have been facing. Uh, we're really grateful for your answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Xavier, uh, what about you? What can you tell us about your experience? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that my Central American identity has impacted a lot. Before, like, like even during my school years here, my parents always taught me, you know, the history of El Salvador, you know, where we came from and our origins. So it didn't feel like I was really lost, like when I was in school, like, you know, from the public school system and post-secondary, where, of course, where we learned about other people and places in the world, as well as, you know, indigenous people here in Canada. I didn't really, I didn't feel like I really struggled a lot. Like, like I knew where my parents came from. I knew the origins, like the towns and the capital city where they came from. And how like they moved here and how they integrated well in Canadian society. Um, although there wasn't much literature or anything that was taught in schools a lot, you know, I always still made a responsibility just to learn like on my own. And it was great because I noticed that there were connections with, you know, different places in the world, like similar struggles similarities like we you know with societal changes so for example you know when El Salvador had the civil war back in the 80s or late 70s I believe, like around that time period um, it was easy to understand how other countries went through their civil wars or you know similar conflicts it was more like I understand like how these people are impacted and where they come from and how we can learn a lot about ourselves and so for this question I would say that as long as I knew the entire history, well, not the entire, as long as I knew a good significant history of El Salvador and a little bit of its geography, it hasn't changed, like, how I struggled with school. It's just good to know, like, where I came from and how I can understand other people of the world. Great. Thank you for your answer. Like, it's interesting to see, like, the contrast between, like, uh, experiences within like the immigration process and how that also that process has like impact differently. That's that's really cool. And for our last first round, uh, let's ask Lilian. So, what about you? What can you tell us about your experience? Uh, Stephanie and Xavier, I wouldn't say that uh, my background as a Central American, more specifically as a Nicaraguan, um, affected my experience here in Canada. I feel like uh, overall, we adapt ourselves like very uh, easily. Uh, I feel like myself as a Nicaraguan, I feel like we went through many uh, challenges through our history and that's what makes us like innovate in different, in different uh, situations and uh, figure things out. No matter how challenging uh, the situation might be, we, we are going to thrive. <laughs> and uh, as Nicaraguans and Central Americans. And um, I think that probably difficulties uh, at, that we face, like Sylvia said, uh, made us that way. So yeah, that's how I feel about that. That was great, thank you. Great, so all of them great answers, uh, unique experiences, of course. And um, yeah, you can see like what we understand as like resilience and being resilient as Lillian was trying to explain like plays a role in how uh immigrants are like how you folks were trying to adapt in the educational system here great so now for a second round uh we have the second question which is uh can you describe your experience with the educational system so basically uh you can describe some of uh your um encounters with it like some experiences that you actually had during like school years or like school days 
So let's start with Stephanie again. Uh, well, yes, I can describe my experience with the educational system uh, by saying that uh, since grade three, I have been bullied for my Salvadoran roots and for the way I look. And, um, you know, other kids would make fun of my uh, Salvadoran culture and accent. Uh, I recall uh, one night school principal tell me that I could not afford an education. Uh, in high school, the guidance counselor would push for me to take applied instead of academic programs. I never had a support system in place within the school. Uh, I recall missing out on prom because of the bullying from my classmates. Uh, for my graduation ceremony, the staff did not allow me to take many photos with my family and friends. So those were the challenges that I faced as, um, I guess you can call it like a second generation uh, Central American here. Um, even though my mother would argue that we are like the first generation of immigrants, like um, regardless of their ethnicity or background. Um, and also, you know, um, my mother would have it more challenging than me. So she would argue that, you know, this research should be, you know, more tar targeted, you know, towards people who were actually born in El Salvador and had to experience, you know, the civil war back in the eighties. So yeah, that's all I could comment uh, for now with that. Thank you so much for sharing such a deep personal experience for sure. Um, we, we have, uh, we acknowledge that many different folks coming from different backgrounds also face similar challenges and it's, it's frustrating, but it's really brave that you decide to share this with us today. I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Xavier again. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more of your experience? Um, yes, so absolutely. So because I was born and raised here, I did have the privilege of attending school here in Canada all of my life. Um, so in the general aspects, you know, for the school system, like K to 12, I went to multicultural schools. So it wasn't really hard to fit in at all. I've always had a background. So it was really great to like learn about different things that people at such a young age. Um, the only year where I wasn't in a multicultural school, like, you know, with different people was in my first year of high school. Um, so, you know, back in grade eight, when, I, when it was time to choose a high school, um, I didn't go at the time when I was still living in my old area, I didn't think about going into my home school just because it wasn't in a very good area and it didn't have a good reputation. So I went to a school in a really good neighborhood of Toronto that was very known for well for its academics. And when I got there, like in my first year of high school, it was like really tough for me to fit in just because now it was a whole group of people. It was like in a predominantly white school. And in the kind of school was that it was like in a wealthy area. So that meant like, it was like a lot of wealthy kids. And it was like really hard to relate and fit in just because of very different experiences. Um, I didn't do so well in my first year just because I didn't really attend class a lot just because I didn't have like a good time in there. And unfortunately my grades suffered for it. So when it came to grade 10 and I was already, I'm already moved. So before high school, I moved into a new area, but I still stuck with the school I went to in grade nine. So after that, I went to a new high school, which is my home school. It was in a very good area, like not the same as the first one, but it was like pretty good. And this time the huge shift was that this school that I went to was multicultural. So like all the other schools I went to in elementary and middle school. So it was not that hard to fit in again. Um, unfortunately, just because I didn't do so well in grade nine, I was moved to applied stream classes. So I wasn't given a chance to do academic stream. Yeah, so the guidance counselors at the time didn't think I would have the potential success to remain in academic stream, which would lead to university or mixed later on in high school. And it kind of made me feel bad because you know I wasn't given a chance just because of my first year and it was only in grade nine so actually looking back now grade nine it's not really that important compared to the later years and had I known that I really would 
wish I would have advocated for myself, but all wasn't lost. So while I still remained in applied and at college, next levels in high school, I did see an opportunity that if I wanted to go to university, I would have to go to college first. And it wasn't that bad because college did prepare me for university. Um, college did prepare me how to do post-secondary writing, like how to do these long essays, like not the high school way, which some people at first year university struggle because they're following the high school methods of, you know, how to write a paper and they don't do so well. So going into college, I actually thrived really well just because, you know, I finally got to study what I wanted at first and just like the structure, like, you know, the days and the times and what I was really interested, it really helped me get good grades. So college, I went on to York University and transitioning into York was actually not that hard. So as I said before, because I was already familiar with some post-secondary education, which included writing and note-taking methods, it was a great transition for me. And university is where I still excelled just because I took classes. Like if I wasn't taking like requirement classes, I took like, you know, electives, for example, I took the classes that were of great interest to me something that I really wanted to learn more about a topic in depth and I succeeded very well once you know I really got into the material and yeah same with my major in anthropology just because I really enjoyed it so I took it more seriously of course and yeah so I would say that overall even though it was a long step to get to university or it was like long road path um, it didn't stop me from getting what I wanted so um, now is the next step of after my undergrad, I thought of doing like a master's degree in anthropology, but I think that's something I might hold on into the future, just trying to look for like jobs in a career that's like related to anthropology. But yeah, I would say definitely um, it can be a little challenging at first if, you know, you made mistakes. But if you do, there's always a will. Like, there's always a way. Great. Thank you so much. Like, I will say that that's when you start, like, differ differentiating between, like, uh, experiences in high school and university. Because, like, I've also heard that experiences at university and especially college and university might change because, like, th there's, like, a kind of a different environment. So, like, yeah, for folks that have taken high school here, it's a complete different experience because, like, they start having a knowledge about how their career pathway uh, can turn, but also that depends on, like, the support and the resources that the school offers. So it's really interesting about how you share this experience of like taking a little bit of a long time uh, in comparison to other folks that just go straight to university just because uh, you were not like maybe offered with the right resources or like with the attention that maybe you were like asking for. So that experience like it's really valuable and thank you so much for sharing, Xavier. And, and finally- And also your experience is, sorry. Um, yeah. Your experiences in a multicultural school is interesting to hear versus a predominantly white school. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, that too. Thank you, Sarah, for highlighting that point. Um, and finally, Lillian, uh, tell us a little bit about you. So far uh, here in Canada, my only experience has been with the language, uh, language institutions. So, well, I don't have as many uh, stories, but uh, so far what I experienced is that I didn't have like a, a like I said a complete shock between what is like college and what it's uh, what I re uh, what was my education back home. Um, I think one of the things that uh, influence a lot that is that uh, at least in my personal experience, private education prepares you in a in Nicaragua prepares you to college and university and even international uh, um, education. Uh, so um, when I when I arrived to this uh, language classes, it was an English class. We, they they would um, provide you like uh, this, these APA or presentation skills or uh, note taking skills, all those skills that you need for college and for university, for academic for an academic program. But uh, thankfully for me, all of that I already learned that at school and. I noticed that 
while, while I was in, in, the, uh, in my English classes, that no, not everybody had the same experience. Same thing would be in Nicaragua. Not everybody has the same experience with all of those skills. That, and that's where I, I knew that all, all the privileges that we have, in, uh, some of us, and, um, and be thankful for that. And I would say that uh, when it comes to Canadian education, maybe uh, the cultural uh, part is one of the main challenges for us uh, because um, some uh, ways on how we communicate may be a different to a different culture how we express ourselves. And you have to be like 100% aware and acknowledge that uh, what, what works for you might not work for somebody else. And well, there's a lot here in Canada. There's uh, also one of the things that I uh, notice is the diversity in everything. There's, a, a, there's so much diversity and so much to learn. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm still working on. And hopefully in the, in the future, I can still continue learning on that. And yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I just, I would like just to highlight a point about like um, how you compare both uh, educational systems uh, back there in Nicaragua and here in Canada, because many folks also have expressed like there's sometimes a gap. Usually folks that come here for uh, college or university, they say like, oh, maybe I already learned this in high school, but I'm doing this again. You know what I mean? Or like the different gaps between the levels. That's really interesting to point out. And um, for sure, like um, the multicultural essence uh, I'm finding like people from all over the world it makes like a little bit challenging to understand the systems because somehow everybody's trying to understand the same system and no like at the end it seems like nobody has like a true idea about how the system works uh so uh, that's really interesting and yeah cultural definitely sometimes might take uh, a big part in how the experience is being shaped yeah sorry do you want to say something Oh, that was great. Yeah, I, I agree with your sentiments. Oh, cool. Um, um, does anybody have any final thoughts or um, anything they'd like to say before we end this webinar? Well, um, I just wanted to say that um, people like who are immigrants, for example, like my mother or, you know, her sisters uh, who passed away here, like they would have to start from like really from scratch, from zero here in Toronto because I know the education system back home in El Salvador is not the same here because if you if you study for example a certain career like let's say a lawyer back home you would have to again start from scratch here because that happened to a family friend of ours from my uncle's side um well it's his family side uh but he's she's like our our, our friend and um she had to uh, redo her her studies um, here in, in Canada that she just decided to to become something else instead um, uh, like a like a social worker uh, instead of uh, pursuing the same career she had back home as a, as a lawyer um, yeah because um, her her husband is is the brother of my uncle so that's how I I know like uh, we treat her like a family friend so. That's why I, I understand that it's it's not the same back home and here and and also like I have family back home who are like are dying to come to Canada and they can't right because um, there's no uh, current visas for El Salvador and it has been like that for many 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 years and you know just my uncle recently came but he came uh, because he's he's one of uh, my mom's brother. And my, because my aunt, you know, passed away from cancer, so he came on a humanitarian visa. So that's how I know it's it's not, you know, the same. Um, yeah, and and same like for example, my husband, like he he's from Mexico, and I had to sponsor him to come to Canada. So um, that's why I know that the system, you know, can be very complicated, especially in the education system, because my husband, he also you know, struggles to find work here in Canada because he has to start from scratch. Like he would have to redo his, his education or find an equivalence like in high school diploma or something. Uh, 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would like to point out that, uh, uh, yeah, in terms of immigration processes and like the overall like um, idea of like coming here to Canada, sometimes put folks in disadvantage just because as you said, like sometimes uh, they need to come back to school to lower levels or like try to prove what they already know and what they already have worked on during their lives back there in their uh, home countries. So definitely that's a challenge that a lot of uh, immigrants uh, face uh, every day, uh, which um, honestly, it's a little bit um, concerning. And at the end, it's not fair because uh, what what matters is uh, what you already know, how you can contribute to community rather than like actually like trying to do everything all over again, knowing that you already have the skills to to share with your community and to actually put them in practice, right? So thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing that really significant point. Cause like, that's when you start finding some gaps in the system. Yeah. And thank you for highlighting also uh, employment issues um, for immigrants as well. I think that's really important to discuss. Um, and and it is it is hard for, for people who have a higher education in, in different countries and they come here, it can really be a struggle. So thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much everyone for participating in our first official webinar for this series. Uh, we're so thankful for having you and for like listening to this amazing and uh, really touching princess. Um, and we will be a, a tuning soon with more webinars uh, talking about more experiences of different folks in the Canadian educational system. So thank you so much. And we hope you have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.